Dames en heren, ladies and gentlemen, geachte collega's en collega's. Ik geef u van harte welkom op de openbare documentaarsverdediging van Katja Ritosa en de graag zitting voor de ogen. Mevrouw Katja Ritosa, Master of Mechanical Engineering van de University of Zagreb in Kroatië, heeft aan de faculteit een proefschrift voorgelegd dat handelt over Assessing the Thermal Performance of Building Envelopes Based on Limited Onboard Measured Data, Determining the Heat Loss Coefficient on Large Scale. En dat ziet u ook hier achter mij op het scherm staan. In het Nederlands is dat vertaald als het inschatten van de thermische prestaties van de gebouwschil op basis van beperkte tijdens gebruik verzamelde metadata. Metadata, bepaling van de warmteverliescoëfficiënt op een grotere schaal. En dit tot het verkrijgen van de graad van dokter in de nieuwswetenschap. Zoals ze zal mijn proefschrift nu verdedigen. En ik vraag erom aan de kandidaten om eerst een uiteenzetting te geven van ongeveer 45 minuten over haar werk. En daarna zou de gelegenheid zijn tot het maken van opmerkingen en het stellen van vragen. So, can I just explain who you are, why we are here today? And then you will give a presentation of about 45 minutes about your work. After that, there will be some questions, I guess, from the first row, but also from the people in the room. If they want to, they can ask questions, make remarks. But now the floor is yours. Please. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. First of all, uh, thank you for all being here today with me and uh, for me. So uh, I decided to start from oh, one second. I decided to start uh, from something that you all know. So my PhD uh, is something about buildings. So we start from here. Um, buildings as, as structures are made for creating um, our indoor environments and to protect us from the uh, weather conditions and the outdoor environment. So the out indoor environment in which we uh, live, work and strive in uh, to be as pleasant as we have it uses uh, energy and uh, um, as um, some, one aspect which is often overlooked is uh, how much energy does our indoor environment need to be as pleasant and comfortable for us. And something that many people don't think about is uh, how efficiently this energy is used. Um, many would think that um, the actual energy which is needed for a building to operate is the one which is calculated in the project phase or the one which is assessed uh, using energy performance certificates. However, the truth is uh, far from that. And often uh, the uh, designed uh, energy performance of building uh, differs very much from the one which is actually uh, achieved in use. And this uh, difference, this discrepancy is called the energy performance gap. And there are several factors which influence this energy performance gap. And uh, those are the uh, occupancy behavior the system efficiency in and the envelope performance. So even if the occupants and the systems perform optimally, if the uh, envelope is not uh, well built, there will be a very high uh, heat exchange between the indoors and the outdoors, and we will have uh, high energy losses. So um, my uh, my focus here on in my during my uh, PhD was actually on assessing these segments of the envelope. Um, there was one interesting study done more than 10 years ago in the UK, which showed on a sample of 18 buildings that uh, the uh, measured um, energy performance is often, it's, it's very um, different from the one which was predicted. And sometimes the discrepancy was even 100%, which is uh, huge. And uh, as you can see, okay, the predicted one is the one from the projects, but there is a way to measure it as they did in this case. But uh, how was it measured? So it was measured in a very scientific way using uh, a lot of equipment in a very uh, uh, comprehensively monitored environment. So not something that can be uh, extended or applied to, to many buildings as for example, ABCs are. So, um, and 
if it was more accessible, probably would you like to know how your building actually performs uh, compared to what was what it was it's supposed to perform? Um, I guess that for most of you, the answer would be yes. So there is definitely a need of characterizing the as-built thermal performance of dwellings in a more convenient way. Um, so uh, starting from a step back, what can be an indicator for the as-built uh, energy performance of the dwelling or the building envelope? So in this study, which I, I used the uh, heat loss coefficient, which is a stationary performance indicator, which considers both the thermal resistance and the air tightness of the of the building envelope and in practice it means um, it's quantified as a, a needed energy to maintain an indoor uh, temperature uh, divided by the difference between the indoors and the outdoors uh, temperature and uh, what is usually monitored in those uh, um, to assess the heat loss coefficient so it's the heating demand the indoor temperature and uh, some weather conditions like the temperature uh, outdoor temperature, uh, wind speed, and solar irradiation, the gains and losses of the occupants, um, uh, the gains of the occupants, internal heat gains, solar gains, ventilation, and infiltration uh, losses. So, and this data is then monitored with uh, different devices and stored in a, a form of time series. Um, and the measurements which are performed are therefore paired with uh, statistical models to calculate the heat loss coefficient. So we have two divisions of uh, statistical models. The first one is, uh, by the way, inputs and outputs are correlated inside the models. So we, we start from the black box models for which we just use measure data and we don't know anything about the building. And on the completely opposite side, we have white box models, which um, are the completely defined with equations and some, for example, one type of uh, white box models are uh, building energy simulations. And therefore we also have gray box models which are somewhere in between those two types. And uh, the other division of um, statistical models we have are static and uh, dynamic models. So the, the main difference between static and dynamic models is the static models actually uh, average out the uh, time series for a longer frequencies for, so for example, daily or, or weekly averages. And for the dynamic one, we monitor the indoor environment more uh, frequently, so at uh, 10 minutes or one hour uh, or more hours um, averages. So what are the possible combinations of the uh, monitored inputs and the statistical models? Um, so the first one, which I already mentioned before, is uh, the type of measurement which is very dedicated. And so we need a lot of equipment for it. And one of this uh, example is the coheating test, which is very famous and used in academia to measure the, um, the heat loss coefficient of the building envelope. For such tests, um, for such tests, we need um, additional equipment in our house. And the main um, problem with this kind of test is that the occupants actually need to leave the house and go away from uh, several weeks. Um, and then the house is uh, subjected to an elevated indoor temperature of between 25 or 30 degrees, which needs to be steady, kept steady for uh, several days. And it's done with electrical heaters and fans and other temperature sensors are positioned in the house. Then additional tests are performed, like the lower door test, for example, uh, which helps us to um, uh, detect uh, how much is the um, air, air tightness of the building. And also a weather station is uh, mounted on site. And with these models, since uh, the temperature is uh, steady during the experiments, so there are no, no changes, no dynamic, we usually uh, pair them with, uh, with static models to uh, anal analyze the heat loss coefficient. So as I already stated, some drawbacks of these kind of approaches. So they uh, require extensive measurements, which are space evading, uh, uh, time extensive and costly. And they are, of course, because of these uh, complex uh, setups in performed just on individual dwellings. And um, we would like to have a method which uh, can transition to some measurements in use and on board, and uh, also be able to exploit, uh, for example, smart meters and data which is accessible uh, from online platforms like weather data. And with the final goal to applying this to many buildings without visiting every of these buildings while doing so. And uh, that's why we want to tra uh, transition to onboard and in use monitoring. So we lose all this additional equipment and we install here and there some sensors, preferably. 
So uh, the um, monitoring devices which can be used are the electricity meters, which already most of you have at home, gas meters, uh, additional heat flow meters, for example. Um, the data can be retrieved from online because nowadays it's very accessible. And additional sm uh, smart equipment, for example, thermostats or other uh, smart equipment at, uh, in uh, modern homes. And for this kind of uh, measurements, we can use both uh, static and uh, dynamic models. So, of course, I'm not inventing this, uh, so such uh, assessment methods already exist, but they are also tested individually and they are not yet uh, sufficiently researched to be applied on uh, uh, in a, a wide range. So, um, if we come to the main objective of my thesis, uh, which is to develop um, reliable and fast uh, methodologies to assess the um, heat loss coefficient, which are applicable on a large number of dwellings, uh, and with just some limited data available, so exclude the very dedicated measurements, and with the end goal to inform uh, users and stakeholders on how their uh, buildings perform. So uh, three main research questions were uh, formed. So the first one is how to upscale the existing methods, which are developed in individual dwellings, to more dwellings in an unsup unsupervised way, uh, which have just limited data available. The second question is uh, what is the expected accuracy um, if we start from an ideal data set, so let's set some kind of expectations for it. And the third question is uh, how do this simplified monitoring setups, which can be replicable in real life and extended to many houses, um, uh, how reliable are they? How, how, um, how big is the uncertainty of the heat loss coefficient when we simplify the monitoring? And to do so, uh, my work was split in uh, three parts. The first part was the uh, large scale uh, creation of a large scale artificial, artificial data set. The second part was development of an assessment procedure. And the third part was the final estimation of the heat loss coefficient. So starting from uh, part one, uh, <coughs> why we used uh, an artificial data set here. That's, that's uh, yeah, the uh, crucial part. So if we want to collect dedicated, like very detailed measurements, even on onboard data in real life, it would be very uh, still expensive and it will take a lot of time. And there will be uh, also some uh, other constraints, for example, um, heat sources we cannot measure and also some measurement uncertainty. So to avoid that, um, we decided to start the um, development of the method on an artificial simulated data set. Another good point of artificial uh, data is that uh, the building properties are completely known, and uh, this way it's also possible to compare it to an, uh, the outcome of the methodology to a real reference. And also this gives us the opportunity to compare the dedicated experiments, which I mentioned, and also uh, results from onboard measurements in the same environment, so in the same weather conditions on the same building stock, which is uh, in real life not possible to do. So um, how the, is the, was the data set created? So uh, the simulated neighborhood uh, was based on uh, research from uh, other uh, universities and research groups. So validated research, I did not uh, uh, start from zero. I uh, merged different uh, approaches from other uh, researchers. So this would be the main framework of, uh, of the development of the data set. So the main the core of this is the Deezer Urban Building Energy Modeling Tool, which uh, serves as a Python environment in which we select different inputs. Uh, this environment creates the set of simulations, runs them, and also um, creates data sets uh, similar to like time series data sets uh, as output, which we later use to assess the heat loss coefficient. So starting from uh, the building properties, here, um, what was uh, done is that uh, I built upon work of uh, my colleague Ina, uh, and uh, there um, 3D scans of a neighborhood in the city of Genk were used for the geometry of buildings, and there were uh, several thousands of different geometries which um, which um, were uh, used to define the sizes of different building elements. And then uh, these uh, geometries were paired with different uh, uh, materials in a way that uh, we created a low performing and a well performing uh, neighborhood. So the low performing neighborhood 
are the buildings which are built before 2006, so before major legislation changes, and uh, the data set uh, which was created also dates uh, for uh, has um, has information about buildings which were built even before 1945, and there there are four building periods uh, in this uh, data set, and uh, the properties for uh, wall, window, roof, and floor were selected uh, for each of uh, for each house based on their age. And this data is from the energy promise certificates for uh, those uh, buildings. Then we have a well-performing neighborhood, um, which are the newer buildings built after 2006. And uh, their uh, properties are based uh, on data from the energy performance in building directive. So the data on those, on a set of houses in, uh, so what it was maybe important here to say that the one data set is the one for properties and one data set is one for geometries and then they are allocated based on age. Um, and uh, afterwards, uh, these building properties were input in, uh, in teaser and also the climate was input. So the climate which was selected was the uh, year 2016 of this location in Heverlem. And uh, since the buildings are simulated in use, uh, an occupancy schedule was also selected, which would be the um, Europe uh, package, uh, which was developed at the Ghent University. And this um, defines the heating preferences, internal gains, and domestic uh, hot water needs for uh, each household. And these occupancy patterns reflect single family houses, and um, they are allocated, they are they're created based on uh, a number of occupants and uh, the type of occupancy, so the, their presence and the probability of their activities in uh, in the homes. Here you can see uh, an example of the um, uh, different uh, median temperatures for different uh, families. And a thousand of these profiles was created and also uh, in this case randomly allocated to each of the created houses. And all these inputs were, were uh, then fed to, to teaser which created uh, Daimola um, models um, with the ideas package and um, the yearly simulation was run and the output of this was a uh, time series which represented uh, different quantum variables but important, the most important part is that the heating <laughs> demand was just the exactly needed demand, so the net energy demand. So in the next step, heating systems were allocated um, in a probabilistic way so in, in, in a data-driven way in post-processing, uh, six types of gas fire heating systems were added to each of the house. So uh, different types of boilers were allocated, so condensing or non-condensing boiler, and three different types of domestic hot water generation uh, direct with storage and uh, no domestic hot water generation. And uh, different efficiencies in the system were added. So the emission distribution control and storage efficiency um, and in the end, the production of the boiler, which was um, computed in a, a low dependent way. So that's why we have this kind of uh, curves. For example, this graph shows the energy demand on the X axis and the uh, production efficiency on the uh, Y axis. Uh, and um, when the simulation were done, uh, there was a total of uh, 1,086 uh, uh, low performing buildings and 1021 uh, well performing buildings and as I, I said there was uh, they were simulated for one year in this graph you can see the uh, energy balance for uh, these two building stocks they are divided uh, each building stock is divided in uh, four four groups based on their uh, lo uh, supposed losses so the um, the U UA value of their envelopes and what is important for you here to notice is that in orange, uh, we have the um, net demand. And you can see that for the old data set is much, much several times higher than for the newly built data set. And uh, the losses as well are much, much higher for the uh, low performing buildings. While on the other hand, the internal gains and domestic hot water, for example, needs are always the same and uh, therefore uh, they will have a greater impact in uh, well-performing houses because they have a bigger share in the energy balance and we will come to that much later. So the outcome of this first part was this detailed data set 
which uh, reflects the in-use behavior of uh, two, two neighborhoods, and it can be used for different purposes, for, uh, for assessing the uh, energy performance as I did, or also different uh, analysis on individual dwellings or building stocks. And I'm very happy to say that uh, some of my colleagues and also students already uh, use this data set in their work. Then coming to the uh, second part, the assessment procedures. So um, as I already said, the existing uh, procedures and statistical models uh, are developed mainly on individual dwellings and uh, they're also validated by research and verified on them. And uh, this large scale data set provides a super great environment to um, and a variety of buildings to explore uh, the, these possibilities of different statistical methods and also their robustness. And EVT ends goal to expand the existing methodology uh, to an unlimited number of dwellings uh, in uh, an automated and unsupervised way. So I'm, I'm going back to, to the graph which I showed before. Uh, so the type of models which I focused mostly are the dynamic black box IRX models <laughs> for which I developed um, the assessment procedure. So what does black box mean? As I already said, it's, it means that the model is purely data driven, so there is no knowledge on the, um, on the building. And um, so also in practice, uh, nobody needs to visit this building to know some properties of it. Uh, the dynamic port uh, means that this kind of model can capture the dynamic behavior and changes um, in the um, uh, caused, caused by occupants or uh, other occurrences in the uh, in the house. And the IRX means autoregressive with exogenous input is the name of the model, and I will explain it a bit better now in the next slide. Here you can see a general equation of ARX models. So as I already said, uh, the way how uh, models, uh, statistical model cover the inputs and the uh, outputs. Here the output of the model is the um, in indoor temperature, while the outputs were the um, heat uh, input, um, outdoor temperature, solar gains, and, and wind speed. And um, these two were fitted uh, using uh, transfer functions here are um, omega and, and phi. And uh, what is important in this kind of models is that the dynamic uh, aspect is uh, reflected by including previous time steps of each of the inputs and the outputs. And that is reflected in this B, which is the backshift operator, and in the model order, which would uh, mean how many previous steps of each input are included and reflected in the model. And therefore, after the model is fit, the heat loss coefficient is calculated by this uh, coefficient fit to the transfer functions using this simple equation. And the nice part of IRX models is they, uh, even if maybe it doesn't look like, are very easy to compute because they are multiple linear regressions and they are also this way uh, easy to automate. So how was uh, how were the model automated and uh, models automated and validated? So for this unsupervised selection, unsupervised would mean that I did not look in every house, but I created a code which selects the best model for each of the houses. So it, uh, the, this selection was based on two criteria, which was the statistical significance of each of the variables in the model and the autocorrelation of the residuals. And the model was considered valid where, where the residuals resembled white noise. And uh, there were also different uh, ways of uh, expanding the models with different, with more previous steps. Uh, and it was um, it was found that the forest selection procedure was the most uh, suitable to do so. And in this analysis, also the optimal monitoring frequency was. Um, was assessed and it was found to be between one and six hours, depending uh, if it's like in the well-performing or low-performing building stock. What you can see in this graph is um, how fast the result converges close to the uh, reference value with using different monitoring uh, frequency. And uh, while well, for lower frequencies, it comes uh, in 10% from the reference a bit faster than for, uh, for example, for three hours is faster than for 12 hours. Then uh, afterwards, also the analysis of suitable uh, monitoring periods was uh, performed and it indicated that one winter month was good enough if it was measured in 
uh, uh, suitable frequency was good enough to have an accurate uh, heat loss coefficient. And what was the um, final outcome of this? So the method was developed on an ideal monitoring setup with, where everything was completely defined. And uh, in these graphs, you can see on the x-axis is the target for um, each building and the calculated heat loss coefficient is on the y-axis and every dot on this graph represents one building. So on the left side you have the um, low performing building stock and on the right side you have the well performing building stocks and as you can visually also see that there is a quite good alignment with the diagonal which shows the desired outcome. And what is the takeaway from this part? So uh, it was um, as I already said, this part was setting the expectation, what is the best possible heat loss coefficient we can calculate. And um, the outcome is that this developed methodology can um, uh, create uh, statistically valid estimates uh, within 10% of the target for 85% of both building stocks and in 20% uh, far from the target for uh, 98% uh, of both building stocks. So it's a um, very, uh, very good result. Uh, the next part of the assessment procedure um, was focused back again on the uh, co-heating test, which I introduced before. So if we want to apply uh, onboard methodologies in real life, we again need some kind of reference. And usually uh, these dedicated experiments as the co-heating test are used in be as benchmark in real life. And in this part, uh, I wanted to investigate this uh, Co-heating test and its reliability using a, the simulated data and the same building stock as used for the IRX modeling. This setup I already explained before, but I didn't explain the type of um, statistical models which are used usually. So, um, as I said, static models, and it would usually in this case it means linear regression, which uh, I guess you all uh, are very familiar with the, with the equation of the, on the left. And uh, basically, this type of uh, linear regression has the heat loss coefficient and the solar aperture on um, as dependent variables. So on one axis, uh, the uh, overall heat input is plotted on the as on the y axis. On the x axis is the temperature difference, and on the uh, z axis is the uh, solar um, solar gains. And then, therefore, the heat loss coefficient is calculated as a slope. So the results of this part show that uh, with simulated co-heating tests and this simple linear regression, we can get an accuracy which is very similar to the one of the uh, uh, IRX. So the performance is almost the same, by, but you need to keep in mind uh, the complex setup which is used, for example, to perform co-heating tests and uh, the onboard uh, measurements. In this part of the work, also different uh, parameters and their influence on the heat loss coefficient calculated with the co-heating test. We are, we are done, for example, a different statistical models. So there's, this is one linear regression, but there are also other types of linear regressions. Then the uh, monitoring length and frequency, uh, how, they, how it impacts the, um, the estimate and also the weather conditions. And here was an interesting outcome that, for example, in the Belgian climate, only 20% of the year is suitable to perform such tests and expect the result to be uh, inside 10% from the reference. So uh, to answer the question, how reliable is the co-heating test? It is proven reliable. And, um, but the thing is here we use simulated data and uh, very precise measurements. While we would expect that in real life, there would be other disturbances and also measurement errors, which would uh, contribute to the uh, uncertainty. Then the third part, it basically combines the first and the second part, so the um, different uh, simulation and outputs, like the monitoring outputs, and the developed methodology. So uh, here, the, in the first uh, few slides, uh, I will talk about different monitoring variables. And uh, also, each of these variables can be pre-processed to make it uh, more informative in a way so it can, in the end, improve the estimation of the heat loss coefficient. And um, since each of these variables cannot 
uh, calculate the heat loss coefficient itself, they always need to come in different setups or monitoring packages. Also, the cumulative uncertainty of uh, these different monitoring packages was also assessed. So we go back to this uh, this picture with uh, different um, different uh, monitoring sources. So uh, what was actually uh, explored in this uh, part was the impact of weather data, the impact of the heating input, or actually where the heating input is measured uh, in the system. So uh, uh, it can be on the emission um, on the radiators or somewhere in the system after the production unit or even just before and it would be like uh, raw gas measurements then um, the indoor temperature and the location of different sensors in the, in the buildings and in the end also the internal gains and their impact so um, the most interesting part of this analysis was the um, exploration of the heating inputs and uh, this way I will explain it a bit more in detail as I told you there are, can be several points of measurements and the first bottleneck while calculating the heat loss coefficient was that when we have a boiler in our house then it creates both space heating and domestic hot water so uh, the share of domestic hot water can be also significant in the overall production and the goal is to uh, decouple it from the overall heat input to get just the net demand which is delivered to the indoor space to keep uh, the indoor space on, an, on a desired temperature. So there are different data-driven decoupling techniques um, which were used here. And uh, for example, it's just interesting to say they uh, one of them, um, just the one in the middle, for example, use, uh, uses a uh, smoother which uh, would cut out these high peaks, uh, which are associated to the domestic hot water needs. And then we kind of filter out the uh, net space heating demand, which here is shown in, uh, in pink. Then the second bottleneck while investigating the heat input was the efficiency of the boiler. So in case we measure just the uh, raw gas, um, there is this conversion factor and what are the losses from the gas meter to our final uh, radiator and there are also in this case uh, I used a post post processing which was based on uh, the type of boiler and the type of uh, the, the domestic hot water system and uh, the um, efficiency curves were like load uh, dependent efficiency curves were allocated based on these system types. So to give you an example of uh, the results and the magnitude of this impact so if we measure the heat flow at the boiler um, so and we don't separate the domestic hot water uh, for the old uh, or low performing building stock the average deviation from target would be 25 percent while from the well performing stock it would be uh, if it would be even 79 percent uh, if we decouple the, the domestic hot water, this uh, deviation is lower to 13% for the low-performing building stock or 18% for the well-performing building stock. In case we measure just at a gas meter and we don't do any post-processing, uh, the um, results can deviate by 44% for the old building stock and even 100% for the newer building stock. And in case uh, the efficiency is allocated, then uh, this uh, deviation can be lowered for uh, to 25, 22% uh, for the uh, buildings built before 2006 and to 80% for the buildings built after 2006. And we can combine different uh, types of post-processing. And then in the uh, final, <laughs> final uh, best case scenario, we can, which is shown in yellow in the for, far. Um, Right, right bottom corner, uh, the deviation can be lowered again to 80% from the target and 23% deviation from the target. Other inputs which were explored, as I said, were the indoor temperature, internal gains and weather, while they had a uh, much less impact on the overall heat loss coefficient. So it was proven that online weather station can serve as a very good alternative to uh, on-site uh, measurement and uh, for newly built the um, the uh, deviation was uh, in median 12 percent one for the um, low performing building stock was uh, around five percent 
Then, um, while measuring the indoor temperature in different uh, zones of the house, if just uh, it will, if the reference was just the base zone, then the deviation was around four percent for both uh, data sets, and unmetered internal gains uh, just contributed to two percent of the estimation accuracy. So, uh, what can we conclude from this part? In general, that in real life we um, we expect the um, parameters uh, which are associated to um, occupants to have a much greater impact and uh, it can be just assessed if we um, we use real life data and um, another thing is that each of the inputs here was um, assessed separately but then when we combine different uh, inputs input packages they also will have another or um, another uh, impact at the on the uncertainty so that's why the next step uh, I move to uh, the different monitoring packages. So how do we look at this figure now? Uh, you look at the different different colors. So uh, each color represents one uh, monitoring packages, one monitoring package, and they uh, are monitoring different uh, level of detail, going from A to D. From the best defined is A to the uh, very raw measurements in in package D. So package A is actually the ideal monitoring, which I introduced all, already before, while package D only takes into account, uh, for example, the online weather measurements, the gross gas and electricity, and there is no even uh, measurement of temperature. It is assumed uh, from standards. So uh, for each of the, um, it's also important to say, for each of the inputs, the best uh, post-processing option was uh, allocated. For each, of, for each of the inputs in, inside the package. And this, uh, these graphs on the right show the uh, results for the uh, low-performing building stock before two, 2006. So the uh, ideal monitoring uh, creates a deviation of in median 5% of the cloud from the diagonal. Then for the package B, which is uh, quite some simplification, it still does not uh, make the results that worse. The deviation is still five percent then for package c is 13 percent and for package d which includes just raw measurements is 18 percent um, while now we can see the results for the uh, well-performing building stock here the deviation is uh, four percent for the ideal package uh, then it grows to eight percent for package b 25 percent for package c and even 54% for uh, package D, which uh, shows that for well-performing dwellings, if we use very raw data, um, it's very difficult to, to assess the heat loss coefficient precisely. So the general conclusion from this part is that uh, for low-performing dwellings, uh, they are mostly affected on the assumptions which were um, done on the, um, on the uh, heating system and the monitoring of the heating system and uh, other sources have a uh, minimal impact as you could if you remember the graphs which were showing the bars like how big was the um, uh, impact or uh, significance of the um, heat input compared to the other inputs then for the well-performed dwellings uh, they are definitely more sensitive to the level of detail of and um, some unmonitored uh, if we let, leave some of the occurrences unmonitored and in general they were also more difficult to fit and they provided higher standard deviations. Uh, in general uh, IRX models are shown to be sensitive to post-processing because any kind of post-processing alters the dynamic of the time series and um, in case of low level of detail static models were also shown to be a good alternative this was this uh, part which was also um, done and it's presented in the manuscript but i didn't have time to show it to you too so and the last part to, to wrap up this analysis is the case study so uh, here the goal was to apply the development methodology on a set of real life houses so uh, 15 uh, test cases from this meter project which was done in the uk were used for this purpose and the main goal was to compare this methodology which was um, assessed on the simulated buildings to a set of real life buildings um, the most important thing to keep in mind uh, at, while looking at the results are the main differences between those two data sets so um, 
the most important is that here only limited and raw data was uh, available, so gas, electricity, and temperature, and also uh, those data was containing uh, different uh, gaps in measurements and also uh, a measurement error. And therefore, the data was needed to, uh, to be carefully pre-processed and picked to a suitable uh, also length to um, to perform the heat loss coefficient assessment. Also, the houses were much, much smaller in size, just 40 to 80 square meters, while the previous data sets were also up to four or 500 square meters. And here, it, uh, since they are social houses, there was a very high occupancy between one and six people in such small space. So it was two and a half people in average per house. So there were several performed analysis. And what was interesting in the beginning um, was that um, here, there was a need to also assess the suitable monitoring frequency for each house. While it was much more easy to do on simulated data, here every house reflected a different dynamics. For example, uh, the example of house number two, you can uh, nicely see how the, um, the estimate converges to the uh, like best case uh, when the frequency was, was six hours. For some houses it was uh, very straightforward to see, for some houses it was more difficult, but in the end, the optimal frequency was selected uh, as the one which the lowest standard deviation. So as I said, only raw gas measurements was pro were provided. So this case was an ideal case to test the uh, decoupling methods for the domestic hot water and the boiler efficiency. But the drawback is that there were no additional measurements to see how well uh, these uh, decoupling methods uh, were performing. We can just assess the result on the heat loss coefficient. However, it was a bit difficult to draw a uh, uh, concrete uh, conclusions about it. So far, uh, one of the methods here, for example, method two shows to have uh, the the best uh, the best fit. However, it, there need bit, there needs to be a bit more of optimization to say uh, exactly which one would be the best. So um, also electricity was used as an indicator of uh, internal gains, but it was done in a very simplified way. So uh, I assume that. Um, and more advanced methods would lead to more information about how the occupancy, how the occupants were performing and what were the exact internal gains for which we didn't have additional measurements. And, uh, as, and also other effects of the occupants uh, were not possible to precisely characterize. For example, the window openings and metabolic gains, which uh, are supposed to be very high because of uh, so many inhabitants on a, such a small uh, space. And to compare the um, results. So uh, this graph is uh, quite uh, important in my thesis. So at the um, x-axis, there is again the coheating use as a reference in this real life scenario. And on the y-axis is the heat loss coefficient, which is calculated. So on the left with the IRX methods and on the right with the linear regression method, which I introduced before. The results which are given from the um, Smitter uh, participants are shown in gray, what my results are shown in pink. And uh, you can see that um, in both cases, my results align very well with what was provided by the participants. However, we can also see that the static methods, which are far less complex, uh, are a bit closer to the reference value. And um, it could be because uh, there the uncertainties provided by different heat sources are um, averaged out during longer periods. So um, in, in, in the conclusion of this part, so uh, the case study demonstrated a lower accuracy than what was predicted uh, considering the artificial data sets. We have uh, some trends emerging but uh, the real life scenarios are um, all very different. And to have some uh, um, consistent conclusions and draw some guidelines, there should be uh, investigation on a, a higher or a larger sample size. So to uh, conclude this presentation, what was to summarize, uh, what was the main contribution of my work? So I developed this methodology to assess the heat loss coefficient as indicator of the thermal performance of uh, building envelopes. And, uh, it, and the, my methodology shows the applicability with different uh, measurement level of details. 
also uh, the uncertainty coming from each um, input and setup is uh, quantified and also uh, everything is complemented with a set of guidelines which can help implementation of such methodologies. And finally, uh, my work uh, contributes to a step towards uh, inhabitants and stakeholders getting insight in the performance of the buildings they, they live in. Uh, to shortly address also the limitations here. So um, the improvement in simulations to make them more detailed, for example, by adding uh, particle heat transfer or uh, more complex occupancy behavior, including um, window openings or also expanding uh, to different system types would um, enable an investigation of different monitoring inputs and there uh, and add them, for example, in the uh, IRX model. And um, in this more comprehensive environment, uh, the also robustness of IRX models, including different uh, more different parameters, it can be further investigated, but also it could be done in um, both simulated and also real life uh, data. And um, to the RX models, it is possible, as I said already, to add more inputs, also automate the selection procedure of the monitoring frequency, which was shown to be important when assessing real life cases. Um, and also uh, something that should be assessed is also the additional uncertainty provided by measurement errors. So both uh, improvement in simulation models and IRX models uh, could, co could contribute to a better understanding of the factors which influence the heat loss coefficient of the building fabric. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, I would like to say something about the possibilities of final application and impact on larger scale. So this methodology could be used um, in energy retrofits of individual buildings, so comparison of before and after, then it could be used as a comparison between houses in one neighborhood uh, and their energy needs. It could be also used in uh, identifying underperforming buildings and this way allocating renovation funds uh, using this kind of methodology. Then it can also be used for planning the energy distribution. And in the end, as I started from, uh, it could be added to energy performance certificates. So not just, uh, we now know just how the building is supposed to perform. And if we add it to energy performance certificate, we would also have an idea of how the building actually performs. So thank you very much. And uh, now I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katia. It's always a good job to have such a presentation at the end of your trajectory. Uh, as a PhD student, you have to uh, you have to go through, through the literature. You have to collect data. You have to model your problem. You have to write your papers, get them published, go to conferences, discuss with your supervisors. So you go deeper and deeper into the subject, and then there is the final defense. You have to open it to a general public. That's quite different. So I appreciate the work you put into it. Thank you. Let me um, introduce the, the members of the jury that may have some questions. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, maybe I should uh, mention first the two most important people that are two supervisors. That's Dirk Sands, who is online. Uh, is COVID just coughing now? <laughs> and uh, the other one is uh, present here, that's uh, Staff Lutz, from the, both from the Department of Civil Engineering. So they will maybe have some questions at the end, but we start traditionally with the people from abroad. So we will start with uh, Professor Thea Zakula from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. So you probably know her better than we do. But uh, thank you for being here with us today and to ask your questions. And then number two is online with uh, Professor Christopher Gors from the School of Architecture, Building and Civil Engineering in Roxbury in the UK. That's on the lower left. That's, uh, you will be number two. And then number three is uh, Monika Richtarikova from the Faculty of Architecture, Design and Engineering of Construction and Architecture. She's sitting there next uh, to 
number one. And then uh, number four is Yala Taverge from the University of Kent. So thank you also for coming over, not that far, but anyway. And then uh, uh, the Mace from the Faculty of Engineering Technology, Department of Civil Engineering as well. She is, uh, and then the two supervisors are the last two last questions, if they have something. So I give the floor first to Professor Zakur. Thank you very much. Katya, thank you for an excellent presentation and very important work. You mentioned several bullet points of how you see this being applied in the future, but I can at least see another like five or six bullet points of, of additional applications. So I think this the work you have done is really important. My first question is on um, unpredictable variable uh, on HVAC system. So you said that there are many unknowns related to HVAC. So my question is, have you considered using data sets from different periods of the year? For example, summertime, when you can nicely see how the consumption, heating consumption related to domestic hot water is you know, what is it? Because the, the heat consumption for domestic hot water heating is relatively constant throughout the year. So maybe looking at different parts of the year would gain you more insights in something that could be used in pre-processing of your data for the winter time. So can you please comment on that? Like, have you considered it or do you think it would be possible? It's a bad idea overall? Okay, thank you for your uh, question. It's a very interesting question, but there was, because there was a time of two years ago when we were also discussing different possibilities. Also, when, when I was the participants in the participant in the Annex project, there were some ideas to do something like that. That's so I'm aware of this idea. However, um, in this work, I did, did not apply it. Um, the, uh, I think the main thing is that when using IRX models, they are very, very, um, um, if, if the time series is not the time series which is actually happening at that moment, it would be very difficult because it could also uh, make the results worse if a data from another period of year was superposed to, I don't know, from summer time to the winter time, if uh, the, this uh, consumption is not happening in the right moment when the time series is monitored, there is always a risk that um, it, it's not correct and it would make maybe the IRX models perform even worse. So that that's uh, one thing. But I, I guess in um, using static methods, when we can average out from longer time steps and have some um, actual uh, daily consumption, for example, then it would uh, it would help to uh, just uh, subtract this domestic hot water needs from the overall. But in general, uh, as IRIX models are so sensitive, also with this kind of processing which was already uh, used, uh, I think it could make also the results even, uh, even less certain. Thank you. And my second question is on a data set. Uh, I see that part being applicable again to many different lines of research. So let's say you know you had thousand bad performing and around thousand uh, high performing and low performing mm -hmm. total. So two thousand and something in total. How do you decide on that number? You know, if I want to do this study for let's say creation, I want to you know take into account diversity of buildings, but very specific to a country. You know, how do you go about it? Like, the, what was, I guess, the reasoning behind you choosing a specific number? Or, uh, why wasn't 500 or why wasn't 2000 uh, for each of the sets? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. Well, this decision was very arbitrary from uh, my side. Um, in general, okay, we were limited with the number of geometries, which were a few thousand, for example, but then there is an unlimited number of possibilities when combining the uh, building properties and the occupancy behavior, we can get a huge, huge amount of dwellings. So here, uh, I think the main constraint also on the complexity of the model and the level of detail was the computation, computational effort used in, uh, in, in this case. So the simulation of 1000 of buildings already took, I think, three to four days on like very nice computers, which we have in the lab. So um, yeah, 
we kind of um, assessed what is the contribution if we make the models more complex or if we run more models. So, but in the end, uh, it showed that a thousand buildings is good enough, not in all parts of my research, but for some conference papers, I not even used the whole data set of a thousand buildings, I used small data sets. So yeah, there was there is no concrete, uh, I would say, answer to this this question but uh, since there were no significant outliers in the end in when uh, we were assessing uh, starting from the ideal data set then i think that uh, thousand buildings for each data set were, were good enough to show that uh, the methodology works thank you that was all from my side and congratulations once again and also to your advice thank you thank you next is professor gross can you please continue Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, Cathy, I'd like to commend you on the quality of the thesis and the comprehensive nature of the work you've undertaken. Uh, I think it's a substantial piece of work and it's going to make a, a significant impact on the uh, sector. Um, you've, you, in, in the private defence and between the public defence, you've, you've picked up a lot of the questions that I've answered, which is really raised which is really useful um, but what one thing that um, you you pick up in your um, uh, is concluding comments is the application of the the potential application of these measurements uh, and hp hdt in 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 use for looking at uh, project projects pre and post retrofit um, and also epc assessment I'm going to pick up on the EPC assessment because um, that's where countries seem most interested in trying to get the use of it on board and monitoring. Um, and, and I, I, I wonder um, how uh, ready you think uh, these measurements are, um, considering the boundaries of EPC, so the A, B, C, D, and E and the F categories um, uh, and, and whether those boundaries might change. I know this is not something you've necessarily covered, but I can see your, mo your, your best position to sort of advise on this at this particular moment in time. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris, for the nice question. So yeah, in general, I, I would start from the um, ABC itself. So as most of you know, allocating those values in most of the cases is also very random. So it's up to the person who comes to the site and then more or less decides how your dwelling is, is built based on the age or based on the systems or whatever is installed or what are the materials which are probably used also in the project. For older houses, there is also no knowledge about the, which exact material is, is in the walls. So um, that also the value itself is also very dependent, as I also mentioned in, in the motivation of my thesis, several um, studies were done on, on that. So how can this complement uh, the APC? I, as I already said, that um, these kind of methodologies are not yet ready to be applicable. So there is a, a huge effort uh, also, as you know, uh, for the heat loss, co uh, the co-heating test to assess the heat loss coefficient is one uh, which is maybe next in line, which could be a standardized, but this uh, onboard measurement still, I think, needs some research, especially on, on real life data to uh, draw some concrete conclusions and, and guidelines. And uh, yeah, I think it needs more effort from uh, many more uh, researchers and universities to get, uh, I, I know, from my side, I know just from the participants of the Annex 71 projects who was doing, uh, who were doing something similar. So there is not that many people who are doing something similar. It's a very niche, um, niche field. So um, in general, I think that uh, this kind of methodologies could give a good idea, or at least uh, give an indicator if the uh, uh, energy performance certificate is at least a bit reliable or it's completely off so starting from this kind of point to say okay this is something something is mismatching we can uh, we can uh, try to see uh, where are the exact problems uh, then afterwards so go for more detail but i think uh, that uh, this kind of analogy can first serve to say which buildings are completely underperforming or off from what they should uh, perform 
Yeah, no, I think that's a very, very good answer. Um, uh, the, the, the other, the other um, uh, question really I've got is, uh, and I think the observation uh, uh, through your analysis of the SMETA data and, um, uh, and comparing that to the simulated data, you got uh, greater variation than you expected to get from the SMETA data. Um, uh, and you did uh, you did make some observations over the the, the time period uh, uh, the data that, you, that was available for for the smeter. Um, I wonder I wonder then uh, in reality as we get onboard monitoring going for much longer periods, um, do, how 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 accurate might those measurements become? Because there'll be more noise, but actually you might get a better appreciation of that noise. So um, I think there's a lot of things that we don't know about uh, long-term on use um, monitoring campaigns. Um, but but um, you, you know, in terms of that difference between the two sets, um, do, do you feel that the, 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 the through longer term monitoring campaigns that the accuracy of these methods will get a lot better, will improve? Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. I'm thinking um, when I got the the Smitter data as it as it was in this raw form, actually uh, long term monitoring it was not actually that long term when we were considering the, a good period, which I believed would give us the most trustworthy estimate. So uh, as I said somewhere in the beginning. Uh, I investigated uh, different uh, monitoring um, lengths and different starting points of the data set, which was not that possible to do in the Smitter case because the winter period of measurements was very short, uh, for example. So I was also limited by the, the length of the data set there. I think it would be interesting to have also the same houses monitored for a few winters to see actually uh, what is the, the impacts of um, of uh, the outdoors variables. For example, uh, when I was assessing the co-heating test, it, I did it much more in detail. And then uh, we saw that uh, if we are aiming to get somewhat reliable uh, estimates, uh, just maybe 20% of the year was uh, good, so, which gave uh, less un uncertainty on the, on the overall estimate. So in general, I think that first we would need longer monitoring campaigns, maybe running uh, over several several uh, winters to see how it uh, and then uh, con continue <coughs> applying the, these methods to see uh, how actually the, the house is performing in, in different uh, conditions because yeah the heating season is rather rather short. Thank you, Katia, and uh, that, that concludes my questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kadikova. Uh, thank you very much, Katja, for a uh, very nice work and uh, really excellently presented uh, results that even people from other fields can understand what you are doing. So this is highly appreciated from my side. I will have a question maybe from the point of view of um, evaluator. So the one who is supposed expert who has to do the, let's say, the analysis. Um, is there a difference in time that you need to See for the experts to evaluate with, for example, with this um, linear regression or with your methods and with the more precise methods, or is it um, comparable? I mean, from the point of view of um, experts, like how much time you have to give as a consultant you know, to get some results? Okay, uh, thank you. That's uh, that's uh, also uh, a nice uh, question. So, of course, everything depends on the level of expertise of the. Uh, a person who is assessing, but also on uh, how easy the method is um, is computed. For example, I spent quite some time developing the uh, R models to do this uh, validation and model selection procedure. It took me uh, several months, even maybe almost my whole second year of PhD was focused on, on developing these aerobics models. But it case, in case these kind of models is all, models are already developed and somebody is just using the final uh, product, then um, I think that uh, maybe a, a few weeks to just get into, into this. But then there is also the issue 
what if this person is not the one who developed it, like if it runs into errors or problems, uh, then the background is very, very uh, broad to like find what is the issue and uh, what what happened and why is this result like to, to validate it uh, also. I think it could if uh, this kind of um, codes were more developed in a way that it has a simple interface in the end, maybe it could be used, I think, easily by other people. But now in stage how I did it, it's very difficult uh, for the end user. So in case um, there should be, you know, more scenarios, which you know, error or like if else in the codes, so it does not uh, give any breaks. But I think in general, if the interface uh, afterwards it's created uh, more user friendly. I, I think maybe a few weeks just to, or a week or two weeks to just understand for an engineer how to use it. I think it wouldn't be that difficult in the end. And the second and the last question. <laughs> it's, uh, it's also related to time. And uh, let's say the time of monitoring, um, because like the total time, like how many days you need at least of monitoring to get reliable mm -hmm. results. Okay, so um, what, what was one of the main conclusions? It would be that, okay, if we are measuring in uh, very cold winter months, the, uh, the, the uncertainty in general would be smaller on the heat loss coefficient because we, we have uh, less solar irradiation, which is one of the uh, main uh, gains, especially if we have newly built houses with very big glazing areas, so it can get significant gains. And the other thing in winter is that the difference between the indoor and outdoor is much higher. So there is less uncertainty. Uh, for, so the, if the gradient is higher, then the model uh, perform, perform better. So uh, in the end, even um, three to four weeks, if the weather conditions are good, if we monitor, for example, the house for the whole year, and then we find, okay, by weather conditions, maybe this is the best period to, um, so this was something that I was thinking of when I was analyzing the real uh, life data from this meter project. What was important when I was selecting that data set was, okay, let, let it be the most possible winter time. And uh, I was looking at the um, heat, um, at the gas meter measurements to have, uh, to know the occupants are present by the, uh, Gas meters, so it's uh, so the heating was was working. Yeah, that that two right. parameters, like yeah. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Katia. Also from my side, thank you for all the work that you did, and uh, also for the work that you did after our first meeting. Um, if you would let me, I would like to continue on the question that, that Christopher posed um, in terms of how to apply this. Um, please go along with the following hypothetical situation. Um, after this meeting, you are hired by an agency uh, that is responsible for the implementation of the EPD in a country or region. Um, and so they ask you to do exactly what you proposed and to um, use this method to detect um, which dwellings um, get a red flag and need to be investigated investigate further. Um, what, in your opinion, are the biggest barriers towards that implementation and which steps would you need to take to overcome those barriers? Okay, thank you. Uh, it's also quite quite interesting going a step much further from the current state. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so hypothetically, uh, you would like to, if we start from a Chris question from the APCs, maybe we can first have them as um, just an information, let's say, on on the building stock, and then if we want to apply the uh, this methodology which i developed 
I think uh, in most uh, Western Europe countries, we already have a lot of smart meters installed and, uh, for gas and electricity. And that's already a good starting point because we can get insight in the energy needs of houses. However, um, I don't think this data is, is really collected by, by someone. Uh, as far as I know, people need to request to, this data to be collected by the uh, uh, different energy providers. So yeah, the first barrier definitely would be the data availability because to have any kind of basic heat loss coefficient assessment, uh, what uh, was uh, shown here that definitely there should be an information about the required heat and an information about the indoor temperature would be a plus even though in the old building stock uh, it was somewhat fine enough to have the assumption on, on, from this uh, standard, but it would be also good enough, I think, to have uh, a survey uh, on people to say, okay, what is your average uh, temperature on which you heat your, your house for applying static methods, let's say, in a very raw uh, measurement setup. So if we start with this very raw, most basic scenario, uh, then, yeah, uh, just an information about indoor temperature and uh, some gas meter measurement could be good enough to get an idea. And then if you want to go more in detail, also other equipment could be installed, but it is very expensive in general. And as I showed in my work that uh, IRX models perform much better than static models, only if uh, we have a uh, very uh, data of very good quality uh, and suitable level of detail. So if we look at uh, large scale, I, I don't uh, see it uh, that soon that all the houses will be equipped with such a good uh, monitoring equipment. Some smart houses already have very detailed information, which also maybe nobody is collecting would be interesting to have, but uh, also one of the things that needs to be considered are uh, different privacy issues, I think, while collecting data. So um, I guess the first most basic thing would be to collect uh, at least daily gas measurements and let's say a survey of the usual uh, heating uh, uh, temperature to which people heat in their indoors too to get some kind of idea. And based on, on my uh, results, it will be the, the package D, which was shown before for um, low performing dwellings, it could give uh, already some information. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, uh, if you do that, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned in the beginning that in the best conditions, you, know, you would have a 5% difference in 85% of the cases. Um, could you reverse that into an estimate with the not ideal conditions that you just described? Um, in how many cases you would have a false positive? Okay, so if you have something that is um, potentially problematic, but actually it's just a model. Yeah, um, I understand. Well, so far, uh, I did not um, look at this uh, false positives. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what I know is that for yeah, for this kind of raw measurements and uh, uh, the, a very limited uh, setup uh, for low performing dwellings, all results were within the 30% of the uh, reference and um, they were um, statistically valid, but okay, statistically valid does not always mean 100% correct. So, um, yeah, that, that would also be a question maybe for application in, in real life, because in, uh, in simulated cases, also the equations behind the simulations are, are qu quite perfect and the data is uh, quite reliable. So there I would not expect uh, the Sounds positive, but uh, yeah, uh, it's it's a very difficult to say. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. You already pointed to some very important things, like, for example, what is the 
yeah. those who arranged the first yeah. yeah. so there's a concern. Um, do I have time for one more question? Yeah. Um, you may know that uh, one of my hobbies is um, ventilation. Um, and so um, I, uh, since you were kind enough to include the wind speed in your, um, in your IRX model, um, and of course using this kind of methods to on a large scale collect data about ventilation would be very interesting. Um, would it be feasible to um, have some idea of it, so <coughs> Uh, methods that you developed, what the split in the heat loss coefficient between the envelope, uh, physical envelope, let's say, and the airflow, the, the leakage mm -hmm. plus ventilation part. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. I had this discussion uh, with staff a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, one of the next steps would be look into that, like uh, how different parts of the building envelope and different uh, physical mechanisms uh, actually contribute to the overall heat loss coefficient. So for, for me here in the simulations, it was very easy to, to just have the output of the uh, infiltration heat losses, while in real life, um, it should be added as some kind of, um, it could be added as some kind of uh, coefficient, additional coefficient to be fit. Uh, so there was one of uh, my ex-colleagues, uh, Jason, who was doing something similar with the solar aperture in IRX models. So he was using uh, some uh, B-splines to fit some coefficients to explain better this, this variable. And then this additional coefficient was also fit inside IRX and gray box models. So uh, this could be an option to, to add some uh, additional weight to the wind speed and uh, yeah process it a bit differently or example move to some more complex models for example as gray box models on individual cases to to get for some insight in, uh, in what is the, the magnitude and maybe help develop also uh, more uh, complex irx models for such purpose because the my irx model is uh, quite quite simple but the, there can be more complex versions of it Thank you. Okay. Yeah. please. Uh, good morning, Katja. First of all, congratulations with your very clear instruction presentation so, and also with the nice visuals. Uh, my first question is on the investigation of the monitoring variables you did. Uh, you mentioned somewhere that uh, some elementary information from the occupants could help. And also, and you showed it in your presentation, that uh, information on the indoor temperature would also help. But are these information available on the restock level? Uh, well, um, they are not, uh, as I, I know, but if they are, if we would send out uh, questionnaires, or I know that uh, nowadays also all energy providers have some kind of interactive already online sites where you could enter such a simple information on a yearly basis to to get this this uh, kind of kind of data um, i think probably different uh, different organizations have different informations on inhabitants but it's not a database which they don't communicate there is not a single database for for uh, such information. I was looking more at uh, individual building uh, level. If we inspect uh, one house, which we actually know which house, then uh, we could ask uh, inhabitants about information. But on a large stock level, it's still, uh, I think, uh, very difficult to reach to this kind of information about the inhabitants, also the GDPR uh, barriers and, and so on. And related to that, uh, you did not show it today, but in your thesis, there's a really nice table concluding all the impact of the separate parameters. Do you have an idea of the combined impact and how to determine from the table? Okay, so uh, so uh, you mean the, the table which uh, said different monitoring variables and how much in percentage they would uh, contribute? Okay, that table was made uh, like a median value for the each of the stocks. 
Uh, indeed, that's something that I also briefly addressed here, that uh, when it, it was done in that chapter, it was a parametric analysis where everything else was kept ideal and then one parameters were changed one by one. Um, but then when, the, when they are combined, I explored just four, um, four packages. And then in the end, when I looked at the case study, it was not one of the packages which was I proposed before, so it was a bit unlucky. Uh, so uh, in real life, uh, it, it's or not in real life, but in uh, when I combine the monitoring packages, it seems that uh, not the uncertainties are not just uh, multiplied by each other; they <coughs> somehow interact and and overlap. And in the end, uh, the uncertainty uh, it's even a bit smaller than if we accumulate all of them together. So sometimes some effects also in, in a physical way, they uh, over, overlap. So that's why it's very difficult to, to, to decouple them. So that's why I had an attempt of creating monitoring packages. But I think uh, also more monitoring packages somewhere in between could, could be uh, developed to, to perform such uh, more detailed uh, analysis, but yeah, definitely uh, the problem also when, if we consider what, what Yael suggested, also decoupling different uh, effects, it's also difficult because they overlap uh, very much also in, in real life. Okay, and my last question here, you, you already mentioned that if you compare it to the static models, there are each models here, they, they have a worse performance, less robust, uh, yeah, that's not an outcome that you would wish for yourself, I can imagine. Uh, can you explain a little bit more which parameters do influence this conclusion? Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question. This is also something, yeah, when uh, half year year ago, uh, I moved from uh, artificial data set to real life data, and then I realized, okay, it's not as perfect as I imagined. It was a bit of, a, yeah, uh, not a happy moment, but in the end, I think in it contributed uh, to show that um, okay, the methodology can can be applied. The the results are not completely off. They are still in line with uh, what other um, more uh, people who, with more experience who do this uh, as their like main job like in the uh, Smeter project also got the same level of detail, and they probably. Like uncertainty, and they probably worked on this much longer than I just worked on, on it for like maybe uh, two, two months. So, um, I, I forgot what was the question. Can you repeat? Yeah, uh, which parameters influence your Ah, okay, influence. indeed, indeed, yes. Yeah. So, uh, as I already listed, I think uh, the most important were the this main differences in the uh, buildings, like the building stock. Uh, was uh, way different. So these 15 houses were uh, low performing dwellings, but they were very small. And there the occupancy, uh, I think that uh, played the biggest role in this uncertainty because in simulated environment, we could uh, actually uh, take each of the measurements separately, but here we didn't have any idea on anything else but the temperature and gas and electricity measurements while they were ah you mean the comparison ah okay 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 you meant ah that okay sorry i i, I got a bit uh, i was comparing to artificial data and and real life data but if you compare erics and static indeed uh, there um this what I started talking about, the occupancy uh, effects were averaged out over a longer time. So they had indeed a smaller impact in this uh, because I would uh, suspect that uh, there were, for example, higher peaks in metabolic gains. If there are six people in, uh, I don't know, at the e in the evening in a 60 square meter house, that there is a high peak in uh, uh, metabolic gains, which didn't detect, but if it's averaged out over the whole day, then it has uh, a much uh, much uh, lower impact. And that also backs up the this statement that if the level of detail of measurements is very low, that then static models can give also uh, um, satisfactory information about uh, the overall performance. So I, I hope 
this was the, the question you wanted. Yeah. Professor Sands, please. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, Katya. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. I'm very sorry that I could not attend in person. Um, I've had already the opportunity to ask a lot of questions, uh, but I still have one. Uh, and it's related to a television uh, program, Fact Checkers, um, that uh, showed that there is a lot of EPC fraud. And so there was one building that was assessed by four different assessors and they managed to have an EPC that went from a D level to a B level. That's about uh, half uh, of the energy consumption. So imagine that uh, you yeah, you improve still a bit the methods which you now have and you uh, are able to check uh, the efficiencies of the heating uh, system and so on. Uh, my malicious question is, is it possible to fraud uh, your method? And so when, when you look at uh, your results, you end up with high results uh, and sometimes a bit underestimated results. Would it be possible to to uh, to fraud that system, or is it the perfect big brother? Okay, that, that's uh, also interesting to think about. So it it depends. I think it could be bypassed. For example, if we provide to each home, let's say, two three sensors, and we install a heat flow meter, people could displace sensors in a different ways. Uh, so the temperature would, for example, not be uh, in, indicative for the whole house. It wouldn't be, and if we say, okay, please place it in the living room and in the, in the bedroom, and then they both place it next to the stove or something, uh, that, that could be uh, kind of misleading. <laughs> if that was the, uh, I'm not sure. So, so we we would have to add cameras as well. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I guess the gas meters and electricity meters and heat flow meters, people would not know how to mess up with them, maybe. I, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's most on the trust on uh, people not to to displace the measurements. <laughs> but uh, I, the methodology itself, like the IRX models, they, they cannot be uh, fooled. But the the data always can be manipulated. So. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure. It's 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 interesting and also quite difficult to say. It's more about trust than in the end. Well, I think that there's a lot of money involved then because if you are able to follow the system, your your uh, house becomes uh, and the investment will be uh, well. The, the value of your house will increase. And so uh, it's, it's a question on how robust is the system and, and do you know uh, where uh, it, it can fail and, and how uh, can that be avoided? Yeah, that's also something to think about uh, when uh, taking a final uh, implementation in, in real life. So. Yeah, in my work is mostly theoretical and uh, assuming that the measurements are uh, performed correctly. Indeed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. Professor Rules. I've had a lot of meetings with Katja during four years, so there's no need for the, any further questions at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, so finally, to be complete, I should also introduce myself as a final jury member. My name is Adam Agriotteo. I'm from the Department of Computer Science, and the faculty just asked me if I was prepared to chair this uh, PhD. Probably because I'm just old enough to do it, <laughs> and hopefully not too old. But I just remember two things from this uh, presentation. First, it's an important thing, not here. Well, your research results are very important and 
certainly a view of the climate conference that has just been held in Dubai. It's just a tiny part, but nevertheless, it is important. And the second uh, thing I learned is that round the this coefficient is probably the work that on the Scrabble board will work the other of course. <laughs> okay. Maybe some people from the public wants to ask questions because it's a public event. So, yeah. Okay. So in that case, the jury will uh, have a short deliberation and we will be back in a few minutes. Doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen, and the colleagues, the colleagues, I give you tennis from the outside, from the outside, from the exam committee, the exam start with the proof of Dr. King in the years of his company. Mevrouw Katja Mitosa has from the faculty of the proof script to the right of Andelover, assessing the thermal performance of building envelopes based on limited onboard measure, measure data determining the heat loss coefficient on a large scale. And this is the case of the from Dr. Ingenieurswetenschapper and she has the proofschrift in an open bar sitting for the exam commissie to take. The exam commissie has vastgesteld that zowel on the wettelijke and decretale bepalingen as on the voorschriften van the universiteit zich in the winter zaken werd voldaan. Na de raadslagen vertelt de exam commissie dat mevrouw Katja Nidosa voldaan heeft aan alle eisen van de proef in the graph from Dr. Ingenieurs Wetenschappen behaald. So Ms. Katja Ritosa, the examination board has concluded that you have fulfilled all the requirements laid down in the university regulations for the doctoral examination. Therefore, on behalf of the Director of the K. Leuven, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Engineering Science and Civil Engineering. I call in the name of the Director of the K. Leuven, Frederik de Graaf from Dr. Ingenieurs Wetenschappen and Dr. Balken. Okay, we don't have your diploma ready yet, but we have a certificate that we can exchange, and our secretary will hand it over. But by receiving that, you have to sign for the receipt that you really got it. And by uh, signing, you also agree with the following sentence, which I'm just reading now. By obtaining the doctoral degree, you commit yourself to act in accordance with the basic principles of research integrity as described in the area European Code of Conduct, and that includes reliability, honesty, respect, and accountability. So I suppose you agree since you have signed. Of course. <laughs> Thank Congratulations. You. So this ends the official part. I need the floor to the supervisor who has to say a few words to the just young guys.
through the knowledge I've gathered from my previous studies and research, I'm convinced that I'm ready to meet the challenge the concerned PhD program presents. Furthermore, it connects all my fields of interest, which combined with, uh, which combined with my enthusiasm and work ethics, I believe I can give great results. You're really confident at that moment. But I must say now, four years later, I can only confirm it. You did a great job, and the fact that you're standing here confirms what you have written at that moment. So you left Croatia, you started the 1st of October 2019, the PhD project at the section of building physics and sustainable design at the University of Berlin. Unfortunately, only after a few months in Belgium, COVID started which was definitely not a gift for a starting PhD uh, student. The original on-site data collection, which was foreseen in the project, could not, be, uh, could not be achieved. And also the international gatherings of the IA and X71, which were supposed to give you a boost in international contacts and collaboration, uh, they changed to online meetings, which is something different. And the same goes for the international conferences, and participating in an online conference is not exactly something to look forward to. But Katja, you managed very well. You organized yourself in such a way that, with a little help from Ina, you took the first hurdle of your PhD. Instead of the on, uh, data collection on site, you created an artificial data set which you could use in your PhD. But in a PhD, you might encounter many hurdles sometimes unexpected ones, and once in a while, really very tough ones. Along your part came, and which is now an official term in our section, among the PhD students, reviewer number three. <laughs> it was when submitting your first paper, which is always an exciting moment as a PhD student, and overall the paper was very well accepted, but reviewer number three really challenged you. While all the other reviewers agreed after some minor uh, changes and some minor revision, reviewer number three kept on finding points to discuss. And I can tell you that by now, reviewer number three is a common phrase among our PhD students. They pray when they submit a paper do not to be confronted with reviewer number three. And sometimes even there is a scream of frustration when they get back to review, oh no. I had reviewer number three. But Katja, in your style, nice, polite, and committed, you answered all the questions and managed to also take that hurdle. So Katja, yes, you really were a committed PhD student. But you're much more than that. For the audience, do take a look at Katja's Instagram account. <laughs> I wasn't aware of it. They told me last week, Katja is on Instagram. Take a look there. So I had to do that before writing this foundation. And yeah, then you see a different Katja. Um, she describes herself as PhD, engineer, and travel food and life. If you look at the images, not much of PhD and engineer to be seen. But Katja, on the other hand, I think it's a very good description of you, because also for the section, you were actually much more than just one of the PhD students. You really were a very valuable social member of our section. You enjoyed the lunch breaks, and after Christina left, you actually took over as a kind of driving force for organizing, for instance, gifts for PhDs, etc. I would even dare to call you the mother of the International Building Physics Gang, trying to keep the boys within the lines. Don't worry, Adash, do it. Now I will mention no names. <laughs> but Katja, I must say, the last year of the PhD was a little bit hard and tough. You had some personal issues, the end of a long relationship in combination with a final year of the PhD is not a nice combination. And I could notice during our meetings that you were tired and that the happy Katya was often no longer there. And then looking back to the last two weeks, I think you will remember them for quite some time. It looked like all the deadlines came together. 
You have to finalize your PhD manuscript. You really struggled with the structure and phrasing of the introduction. You had to or wanted to write an FWO postdoc application, and you got a review back of one of your papers. So everything came together. But in the end, it turned out well. The FWO postdoc application has been submitted. I still have to write a recommendation letter, but I'll try to do that tomorrow. The manuscript and the presentation of the PhD were ready in time, and as we have seen today, it was really a very nice presentation. So here you stand, I'm very happy to see it, smiling again, as Dr. Katja Ritota. A great achievement, something you can be proud of. And for me, well, it was really a pleasure to be your promoter during this journey. I really appreciate your dedication and work ethics, but I mostly appreciate you as a person you are. So Katja, even as a PhD, please remain this nice combination of engineer researcher and lifelong learner. <laughs> Dr. Ritoza, I wish you all the best in the future and accept the FWO application has been submitted, so hopefully we can enjoy your presence in the lab still for another three years. Congratulations. Many of my friends who are uh, watching me online asked, um, Are you happy now that you're finishing your PhD? And this really uh, um, made me think a lot because um, I think the last four years were uh, probably the best years I ever had. And um, it's mostly because of the people I had uh, around me. Um, of course, most of you are here, but also most uh, a lot of. My dear people, family and friends are, are watching now uh, from different parts of the world and uh, most of them in Croatia. So um, I thank you all because this was a group effort. So uh, first I want to thank, of course, uh, Stav and Dirk who gave me this opportunity. So four and a half years ago, I always remember um, our first um, our first interview, and uh, I think it was somewhere beginning of uh, July, and uh, I was at home and uh, having this interview, and uh, I don't know, it was such a good connection, such a good energy, and afterwards people also asked me, how was the interview? I was like, I think it was good. I made them laugh twice. <laughs> so, thank you for trusting me, and um, Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for giving me all the freedom I needed in the past four years. Of course, with COVID, it was not a usual PhD journey, but I'm very thankful to uh, have had such a such a guidance which was tailored for me and for, for my needs. And I, I really, really loved working with you. And uh, I sometimes think that I really won the supervisor's lottery because also with Thea, and stuff, and with, with Dirk, I really uh, found people who were always there cheering for me in the last years. So thank you very much. Um, of course, I would like to thank also the other members of the uh, committee, which followed my work and always gave uh, such uh, nice input and, and uh, valuable comments, and uh, to also to the ones who just joined now in the last stage and help me finalize it and make it make my PhD more, uh, more valuable, more concrete, and also uh, overall uh, better. Uh, of course, as also Staff said, special thanks to Thea, because she was one of the people who actually pushed me to, to come here. So who knows where would I be? Um, so thank you. Um, and now it comes to the people in the last rows. So uh, my colleagues from the building physics section, uh, I'm so blessed to have worked with you for the past four years. It was uh, it was really uh, a fun time, I would say. Uh, I'm especially 
thankful for the nice uh, lunch table events. Everything that happened around, around that lunch table will stay in my memories and also in some videos which I have on my phone. So it, it, it was fun. It was a fun ride. Um, then, uh, of course, I think that uh, also staff and Dirk and Hans who employ such wonderful people also are very good judges of character because we really uh, have a nice community and we really support each other very, very much. And I'm, I'm so grateful because I know not everybody has this experience during their PhD. So guys, thank, thank you for being exactly as you are. Ah, then there he goes. Uh, there it goes. Very uh, special thanks to, uh, of course, already mentioned Arash, Tohit, and Abdullah. In the past, especially the last year and or two, we've been through a lot collectively, a lot, and I think we bonded more than some people would bond over uh, some decades. So it was it was a very intense friendship. Also, at some point, COVID brought us together because we had only each other, and we became each other's family away from home. So thank you for being there. Then I have some special thanks for the colleagues who supported me a bit a bit more or also helped me some somehow I also delegated some little tasks during the last year uh, to them and uh, they didn't fail me. So thank you for uh, Dan, Lizzie and Sarah who are here uh, for this helping me in this last uh, stage with these little practicalities. And I would also like to thank my ex colleagues, uh, Ina, Christina, and Johan, who, uh, with their help in some way, they, they contributed to, to my PhD, as uh, you can see it uh, now. And um, well, thank you again for my building physics section. I will always feel like I, I belong here. Um, then uh, we go. A step further towards uh, my other friends, who some of them are here, and I'm very happy to see you. Uh, and uh, some of them are watching me from, from home. And uh, I don't know uh, if I started counting all of you and naming, I would probably forget somebody. So I will not, I will not, not do that. But you all know who you are, and uh, uh, I'm grateful for you who have been by my side, some of them, uh, I think online uh, from the 1998 or 99, when I had my first friends, they are still my friends. And then I met some people doing, uh, so kindergarten, and elementary school, uh, high school, university, and I brought with myself uh, all these nice people uh, towards uh, like this moment. And uh, all of them have, uh, special place in my heart and uh, because they know me from different stages of my life but we are all here finally to celebrate and um in the end i want to thank mom and dad <laughs> without them i wouldn't be here at all so thank you thank you for everything and uh, thank you everybody for making this moment one of the most special moments in my life, I think. I love you. Thank you.